Welcome back to Tech Yes City, and this is a little bit of a weird one because this is a Z390 motherboard, and it's coming out a while after Z390 is already released, and I was put under NDA for it. So if that gives you any indication, then maybe Intel's refreshing chips this year. So yeah, there's that. But anyway, as we're with this board, this is the Phantom Gaming 7. They have the aesthetics, pretty much the main focus, and it's pretty interesting because they've got the input output shield pre-attached now to the board itself. And I must admit, this is a trend that is welcome in the industry. I do like this personally. It makes it look clean, makes it look flush. And when you install it, you don't have to worry about forgetting IO shields. Honestly, the amount of used builds I've come into where the people don't include the IO shield when they sell the motherboard is so numerous. And this will definitely eliminate that problem for future generations of used PC parts hustlers. But with that aside, as with any tech, yes, city motherboard review, we'll go from top to bottom with this thing, starting with the VRM. And here they're using a PWM controller known as the Intersil ISL69138, with the MOS driver being the Intersil 6617A. For the actual VRM power phases, they're going with an 8 plus 2 phase power design where the 8 phases are doubled. And for the high and low side MOSFETs, they're using Vichy SIC634 and also SIC654 MOSFETs. For the chokes, we've got Magic 60 amp chokes. And then on capacitors, we've got 12Ks from Nichicon. This is attached to a heatsink that weighs in at about 166 grams. Though when I put my 9900K to five gigahertz at 1.36 volt, and yes, I know a lot of you guys in the comments are telling me about how your 9900K gets to five gigahertz at a lot lower voltages. This is an Enjo sample and it did kind of lose the silicon lottery. It can't even boot at 5.1 gigahertz. So it's a good thing for testing motherboard VRMs, however, because it is like a worst case scenario. And in this case, mine will juice over 180 watts at five gigahertz, and this in turn will stress the VRMs. So I was happy to report that it did pass this stress test. The VRMs, however, did get a little bit uncomfortably hot, as I would say. I like to keep it down under 90 degrees for the surface temperatures when I put the IR camera over it. This was going up to 98 max with a 25 degree C ambient environment. The heatsink is doing a great job with that getting to 72 degrees C. So if you do put a fan over it, it will cool extremely well. So the VRM is decent, will handle a five gigahertz overclock though. If you're more serious about overclocking, may wish to consider the Tai Chi or the Phantom Gaming 9, which comes equipped with a better VRM. Then moving on to the onboard audio, this was very interesting because this is, I keep saying in every review is like usually onboard audio keeps getting better and better. This does have a slight improvement, but there was a catch. They're using the Realtek ALC1220 solution, though it does require a creative driver to get it to function at 100%. So if you don't install the creative driver, there will be noticeable noise past the 2K frequency range. And also the crosstalk will introduce some uh, leakage with the default driver. But once you install that creative driver, not only do you unlock the Sound Blaster Cinema 5 software package, which is actually pretty solid for DSP, especially if you want to play some RPG titles, it does add a level of immersion. But after we installed this driver, the line was looking in the main frequencies pretty much perfectly flat. There was a little bit of a roll off after 10K. This depends on the maker and how they want you to perceive the sound. And under 20 Hertz, we had 20 to 10 Hertz having only a 0.1 decibel drop off. It was so minimal that you'd see the line looking a little bit awkward. Awkward, but really nothing to worry about when we've got 10 to 0 hertz looking like it's got a minus 1 decibel roll off. So basically the onboard audio solution is really good and the crosstalk after you install the driver is literally going to minus 90 dB at 100 volume level. So it doesn't have that problem where I've seen a lot of motherboards in the past year, especially have a leakage problem after a volume level of 90. Under the mic import, this has got a clear amount of noise suppression. So it is great if you want your mates to hear you easily while you're playing games. But on the same token, if you want to do anything professional in terms of recording, I'd suggest getting a different solution so your voice isn't getting nerfed. That is, depending on how strong the noise suppression is, it will take a frequency out of your vocal range and make your voice sound essentially more tinnier than it otherwise would. Anyway, going through more of the features on this board, we've got three PCIe 16 speed slots on the surface. Though looking at the rear of the board, you can see that one's an X16 slot, one's an X8, one's an X4, and then you've got X1s in between. Also PCIe NVMe 3.0 X4, you get two of those slots, so you can RAID zero 
NVMe M.2 drives if you wish to. The board itself also over SATA 3 supports RAID 0, 1, 5 and 10, so it does have a lot of features in terms of what you can do off the onboard chipset itself. Though putting the speeds and the temperatures to the test pass with flying colors. Also USB 3 speeds are fine and you get a dual NIC solution where one of the solutions is the Intel i219V. The speeds tested out fine on that and then you get also a Realtek 2.5G solution so a little bit faster than your 1G solution and coming in as a budget choice so I guess it doesn't cost as much as putting 10G on board. So that's an ASRock solid solution especially if you've got those NASs that support 3 gigabit transfers. Looking at the rear of the board, you get HDMI and display out. You also get two USB 3.2 Gen 2, one of those being a Type C, one of those being a Type A. And I do apologize, this new terminology is sending me a little bit crazy. There was no need for the name changes, but we'll roll with it as it seems to be printed everywhere on the box. And you also get two USB 3.2 gen ones as well as your front usb 3 outs you get two of those as well as a type c out moving into asrox bias nothing's really changed here but on that note nothing really needs to change it's got all your easy support for overclocking you've got the advanced features for overclocking as well as internet flash for your bios so if you don't want to go to a website and download it through windows you can do it via this method you've also got fantastic tuning software which enables you to control each of the port hubs you do get five pwm controlled fan headers on this board and you can control the RGB within the BIOS via the 5 volt addressable RGB header. You've also got two 12 volt RGB headers on board too to control RGB but I have noticed ASRock have been adding more options to the Polychrome RGB software where the north and south bridge of this heatsink do get RGB features integrated from the get-go and it does look very subtle, very easy on the eyes as well as giving the motherboard a little bit of extra flair. Though I will point out so far that this is my favorite solution for RGB control in the BIOS where you don't have to load up any software in Windows which can impact performance. I have tested some of this RGB software from other manufacturers and it can impact CPU performance. So if you guys want RGB control but you don't want anything affecting your games, then Polychrome is currently the best option in my opinion. And in closing, some of the last features to go over, you get a power and reset button up the top, a doctor debug LED down the bottom so you know if there's a BIOS readout problem with the board, you can quickly diagnose it. And there's the option to add an M.2 Wi-Fi if you need Wi-Fi on your motherboard. So with all that out of the way, we are now moving on to the most important thing with an Enthusiast Tech product. And that of course is the price tag, 195 USD. I will update the description with the AUD pricing because I currently can't find a tag on that at the moment. But at this price tag, you get everything in between on a motherboard. It's got a nice thick PCB, decent VRM, amazing onboard audio, dual NICs, the ability to RAID 0 NVMe X4 speeds, and also of course the updated aesthetic and RGB bling. And I must say this is one of my favorite looking ASRock boards that has come through here to date. And also I do welcome that new addition of the integrated IO shield. I think it looks really nice, really handy to have. Though although this board does look like it has everything, I will say one thing, and that is the VRM itself is a mid-range solution. So if you are looking to go real high end on your overclock, say you wanna go for a 5.2 gigahertz overclock, or you have a 9900K that's as bad as mine, then you may wish to step things up to like a Phantom Gaming 9 or a Tai Chi or a Tai Chi Ultimate, where they are equipped with more phases and a slightly better VRM. This one, however, will handle 9900K overclocks at five gigahertz fine, though if you do wanna step it up, then keep in mind that this is kind of like a mid-range VRM solution. And of course, everything else on this board is high-end. I do like the 2.5G solution for the NIC as well. Really nice touch. And that onboard audio is just simply phenomenal. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, then be sure to hit that like button for us. Also, let us know in the comment section below, do you like what ASRock's done here with the aesthetics and all the feature set? Or would you rather them take away from that and just simply go for a high-end VRM at a mid-range price? Love reading your thoughts and opinions as always. And with that said, I'll catch you in another tech video very soon. Peace out for now. Bye.